Awesome. Well, good afternoon. Thank you for being here. Uh, we're super excited for our April workforce webinar, which is going to be all about work based learning. It's the 24th already, which I really can't believe it. Um, if you've never been to one of these uh, webinars before, welcome. And if you're a returning guest, thank you so much or watching on our YouTube channel or via a link sent to you. Uh, thanks for watching on playback. We are super excited uh, to continue this series. We've been doing this for probably eight or nine months now, um, our workforce webinar series. And it's a chance for our talented workforce team and advocacy team at the Minneapolis Regional Chamber to put our heads together to think about content that our members and uh, businesses across the Twin Cities are interested in hearing a little bit more about. And it's that really fun intersection of where we're seeing workforce development and things happening at the state and federal level when it comes to our legislature. Um, what's, what's affecting businesses? What do they wanna know about? What opportunities are there to be um, collaborating or participating or sponsoring in programs that can help them with the ongoing labor workforce shortage? Um, I would be remiss if I didn't introduce myself. Um, good afternoon. I'm Maddie. I work on the talent and workforce team at the Minneapolis Regional Chamber, and I'm going to be the moderator slash host for today. So if you see me kind of clicking around and looking at different things, um, I appreciate your patience. Uh, we want this to be an interactive uh, webinar for you. We want you to feel like you get your questions answered or if you have specific thoughts on pieces that our panelists share, please utilize the Q&A function as well as the chat function. Um, yeah, we're just we're super excited to hear uh, from you and to have you with us. I'm going to stop sharing so we can see all of our panelists, which is fantastic. You'll see they have their first and last name and the organization that they're with, which will help us to kind of identify them throughout the conversation. We have a really great agenda planned where we're going to have the opportunity to hear from each of them. What program are they connected with? What uh, organization or business are they with? Um, and kind of like, why are they a part of the work-based learning conversation that we're having? And Kalia sent me a very great email yesterday, which was, what do we even mean when we say work-based learning? Like, can we just level set on that? And I think that that's a super important piece to bring up. So thanks for that note. Um, I am kind of just going to read the definition that I provided because I felt like it's a good place to start. And maybe that's something people can cover when we get to introductions, if you think of it differently. So when we talk about work-based learning and where it fits in into the workforce development or professional development kind of sphere, we're really talking about different types of encounters that offer students or learners insights and hands-on experiences into the world of work. So um, we, Amanda and I also chatted a little bit on Monday about, is it a spectrum? Is it a ladder? Where do we sort of occupy? Um, so that's what we talk that's what we mean when we talk about um, work-based learning. So looks like there's just a little pop up there, but yeah, I think that's a good place for us to start. Um, I'd love to just toss it to our panelists to introduce themselves, um, maybe just provide a brief overview of your organization or the program that you're here representing. And I think um, I'm gonna start with the Accenture folks first. So Alex or Scott. Sure, I'll start and then, uh hand it to Alex. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Scott Cummings. Um, I'm here kind of wearing two hats, I guess. One, uh, I serve as Accenture's Minnesota market lead and a champion for our Minneapolis Apprentice Program, as well as co-leading the Minnesota Apprentice Network with a colleague from Aon as we advocate for professional apprenticeships in the state of Minnesota. Um, and I'll talk more about that and um, how we're growing that and how we're thinking about that um, as we get into this. And then the, the apprentice program piece is a center's internal entry level program. And that's where I will pass it to Alex. Awesome. <clears throat> Thanks, Scott. And hi, everybody. Great to be here. Uh, as Scott mentioned, Accenture operates uh, an apprenticeship program here in North America. I am part of our North America program, uh, apprenticeship program team. 
I have also helped to lead the expansion of our apprentice networks across the United States. So really looking forward to digging in. Um, just for a little bit of context, our North America apprenticeship program started back in 2016. And today we host apprentices at Accenture across 35 of our North America cities, both on internal facing roles as well as serving our clients. Um, and we have hired over 2,000 apprentices over North America since our program launched. So really looking forward again to digging in on the topic of work-based work learning and how apprenticeships have really been a successful um, part of our talent strategy here at Accenture. Fantastic. Thanks so much, folks. Um, Kalia, can I pass it to you? Of course. Thank you so much, Maddie. And good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kalia Shong, and I am a program manager at the Citizens League. So I guess I'll start off briefly sharing more information. And there goes the lights in the room that I'm in. So give me a moment as I move. <laughs> All right. Well, so briefly sharing about just the work that we do at the Citizens League, and then I will talk briefly again about the work that we are doing at Capital Pathways to just ensure that public policymaking is more accessible to college students of color. Um, a little bit about the Citizens League. We are a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization that really works to engage everyone in civic life and public policymaking. Uh, we've been around for 70 plus years. So we do have a very long history of doing really great public policy work to ensure that Minnesota is a great place to live um, for everyone. Some of the past examples of work that we've done include um, the creation of the Met Council and also championing the nation's first charter school laws as well too. And then currently, we are doing a lot of work to engage community and public policy through our different learning events um, and also just different policy projects that bring together people of variety of different experiences and backgrounds to develop policy solutions to shared and common public policy issues. So as an organization, we really operate through this lens that um, good public policy happens when a diversity of thought and perspectives is represented at the decision-making table. So that's exactly why Capital Pathways was founded. Um, and it was really founded as an opportunity for us to engage college students who identify as Black, Indigenous, or people of color, or BIPOC for short, in public policymaking and in public ser service. Um, Capital Pathways is a, a five month long spring internship experience. Um, and it follows a cohort model that brings together up to 40 college students every program year. In terms of programming, we offer two key components. So the first is the training that we offer our students. And these trainings are all focused on developing their leadership, um, career readiness training, and also, of course, understanding the public policy making process. And then the second really important component um, is the paid and immersive hands-on internship experience for students to work with a different organization or company, a firm, um, who are doing really critical policy or advocacy work during the legislative session. So just really high level information about Citizens League and the work that we're currently doing with the Capital Pathways program. Awesome. I've already just got a couple different items that I'm going to have additional questions on with that. So thanks for the overview. I really appreciate it. Um, Amanda, let's hear about you and Achieve. Awesome. Hi, everybody. Um, happy to be here today. Um, my name is Amanda Justin, and I am a program strategy manager with Achieve Twin Cities. Um, so for those of you who don't know Achieve, we um, do a, a lot of different things, but the primary focus of our work is um, career and college readiness um, with young people. So we um, are in both Minneapolis Public Schools and St. Paul Public Schools, and we have career and college readiness coordinators in the schools um, doing direct service work um, through one-on-one, -on -one really individualized advising with young people and um, coordinating a lot of different experiences um, for career exposure, um, all with the goal of helping young people, you know, develop a really solid post-secondary plan that they feel 
really excited and confident about. Um, and then our other big partnership is with the city of Minneapolis um, on the Step Up Youth Internship Program, um, which is internships for young people over the summer. Um, so a lot of, you know, very awesome partnership work there with the city and Achieve and the local business community, just making sure that young people do get some of those hands-on summer um, experiences to help them figure out what they wanna do um, as a career. Um, and then we also do have a college internship program um, for, um, you know, kind of young people in their next steps when they're in college to also get some more internship experience. Um, and then a lot of our other work is focused on engaging, you know, the community, engaging, the business community and just the local community in general in um, both like education, public education, and just like how we can all all work together to prepare young people for what comes next. Fantastic. Um, so I'm hoping that folks that are on this call, participants, that you're kind of starting to see that we're really aiming with our panel to get at a couple of the different pieces when we talk about the work-based learning spectrum. So. We're going to kind of work um, backwards. I think we're going to start with the Accenture team, and we want to hear more about the apprentice approach. Um, yeah, additional like details, I think, especially that you can share about like length and depth and like positive outcomes that you've seen from this program would be great to hear. Um, and then we're going to hear, I think, a little bit more about a specific like industry focused program with Capital Pathways at Citizens League, and then some of our more action-oriented steps where um, there's maybe some more additional entry points, um, some maybe low-hanging fruits that we can talk about with Amanda at Achieve, but just want to put it out there as well. If anybody at any point wants to jump in or build off of something, let's have a conversation. I know it always is like we're on a call and we want to like follow protocol, but let's um, let's just have some fun. We're all experts on the call. So uh, Accenture folks, let's Throw it to you guys. Awesome. Thanks, Maddie. Scott, you want to kick us off with the network? Sure. Uh, I'll set a little bit of high, high level view of things. Um, our program at Accenture is a 12 month program. We are intentional about not recruiting people who have a four year college, college degree, you know, with the mindset of, you know, we want to go find the talent that we haven't found in the usual talent pools. And I mean, the, there's amazing talent out there, you know, that we haven't been finding it in our old ways. So in the new ways, we're tapping these new news uh, sources and, um, you know, I think to just broaden that out a bit within the network, you know, just to just to represent some other companies and to make the point, like, there's not one apprentice program, you know, that fits in a box where some apprentice programs are two years and are concurrent with community college. Ours is one year typically after community college or a boot camp or military, um, you know, some hire externally, some look to like maybe retail store employees, bring them into corporate roles. And so I, I, I share that to just set the stage of like, you know, there's not one way to do this. You know, each apprentice program is unique to each employer. Um, and I think that there again, that's where Alex can talk more about like how's how ours actually operates and how we support them through the 12 months. And, you know, and I'm happy to share more about how other companies in the network set theirs up as well, too. Awesome. Thanks, Scott. So maybe I will dig in a bit on kind of how our apprenticeship program here at Accenture operates and then I'll toss it back to Scott to talk a little bit more about kind of the value of the network and how bringing other employers along is really at the heart of what we're trying to do as we look to scale and hopefully um, help other employers to adopt apprenticeship as again just one component of their talent strategy. So 
Again, I mentioned at the top of the call, our program started back in 2016. We brought on five apprentices in one location into our Chicago location. And they were brought on primarily to do our internal help desk role. And what we quickly found was that there's a tremendous amount of value in kind of the, the approach of upskilling and really focusing on skills development, not simply looking at an individual's educational credentials as the only indicator of whether or not that they could perform a job or be successful in a role. So fast forward, um, our program, uh, again, as Scott mentioned, is 12 months long. It includes both formal learning as well as on-the-job training and coaching to help apprentices build the, those skills and really advance their careers. Um, in our program, we intentionally bring apprentices on in kind of a cohort model so that they have peers that they can work alongside as they are delivering on this work as well as developing those skills. Um, in terms of success, our program has yielded a really high return on our investment, both from the perspective of um, continuing education. We actually, or excuse me, continuing in their um, career development. We actually, um, over the past two years, have had some of our original apprentices who started within the program, who continued on with Accenture, have made an executive level within our organization, um, as well as retention. So we are seeing on average, compared to their entry level peers, uh, apprentices are staying on approximately 10% longer. So again, we're seeing that the kind of model of apprenticeship is very complementary to the other avenues in which we bring in entry-level talent. Um, I'll pause there and maybe talk um, and hand it back to Scott to talk a little bit again about kind of how we collectively come together within the network. And um, you know, if those listening are maybe interested in exploring more around apprenticeship or talking more in depth about what apprenticeship could look like to meet your talent needs, the networks is a really great place to start. Uh Thanks, Alex. Um, great points. Uh, the network is really employers saying that they believe in this concept, the model, and want to do more, or some are already well on their way. So it's a place for best practice sharing, collaborating. Um, and so far, I mean, you know, we've said, you know, there's no sort of barrier to joining if you're interested or already on your apprentice journey, come on in, you know, so there's no cost. And I mean, so we meet, you know, virtually sometimes, sometimes in person, and it's really just about sharing what works, where you're, you know, where you, where you source from, how you train, who you use to train, how things are going, and you know, tr you know, trying to, you know, you know, the kind of the rising tide floats all all boats thing here. Where I mean, as the apprentice concept comes to professional roles, having more of the training providers understand that and know which employers are supporting that model, it makes it easier for all of us to find the talent, to source, to fill roles. And so it's sharing, it's collaborating, and it's growing. Um, and, you know, as Alex shared in, sh in Chicago, where I actually am today, um, steps away from where we had our first cohort, you know, they now have like a hundred employers who are, are a part of the Chicago network in Minneapolis, St. Paul, you know, we're probably at 15 or 20 where we're five years behind them, but, you know, have the same kind of plans to grow where some employers bring on a couple, some bring on 20, 30 or 40 a year. And so, you know, there again, not each program looks the same, um, you know, but everyone's sharing and helping each 
other where, you know, oftentimes talent is very competitive. We found in this space, you know, there's a lot more sharing. So um, that's a bit more about the, the, the network. And I'll finish with saying, you know, we've now stood up, you know, about 12 of these across the U.S. where there's critical mass of employers who have said, you know, we need to do this. So, you know, if you are a large global national company, you know, you can join in, you know, join the, join the movement in, in, in multiple metro areas. That's fantastic. Well, that's super helpful. And I think you guys got at a couple pieces that I just want to highlight before we hear a little bit more about the Capital Pathways program, which is, um, you know, additionally to kind of setting the stage as to what work-based learning entails and sort of this ominous labor force shortage term that is almost like a bad habit coming out of my mouth now, um, just to kind of reiterate to folks and employers on the call, you know, we really see and totally agree that um, work-based learning, whether, you know, you're at sort of like maybe the easier end of the spectrum or you're really looking to invest large amounts of money and time and capacity, we think it is really important to have a very unique and um, customized talent strategy because we are just finding that um, the, the times are changing, that, yeah, there are a lot of folks that for a long time were overlooked because maybe they didn't have access to a four-year degree, maybe they had started and then maybe got some experiences in other areas of their life. Um, just want to reiterate that that's a super important point and really um, sh making a uh, conscious shift to that skills-based orientation and really building that into programs is just really exciting to hear. So yeah, just love the the kind of upscaling skills focus that Alex, that you touched on. I think that that's, that is just so exciting and really fun and that the cohort model is still you know, something that you guys are utilizing because, yeah, being able to share with peers and kind of that that learning approach works within the program itself. And then, you know, to Scott's point to the network um, that if you are a business, um, we know that businesses don't follow city or state boundaries that you may be operating in lots of different areas that you understand that there is um, sort of a community of practice that is ongoing, um, not just here in the Twin Cities, but other places that we would love to get you connected to. So, Amazing. I think uh, I'd love to transfer over now to Kalia to hear a little bit more about the Capital Pathways. And we were super excited, our advocacy team, to have, um, you know, the perspective of really talking about advocacy careers. I think that's something that, um, you know, on the workforce team, we'd love to include more of. It obviously is super beneficial to our organization in particular. But um, yeah, maybe just a little bit of uh, if you have any success stories that you want to pull out or pieces that um, you want to highlight since um, Accenture has shared a little bit about the Apprentice Network. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Maddie. And I, I'll just piggyback on what Scott said earlier, that um, similar to what he said, um, all internships look very different too. Uh, with Capital Pathways, we utilize the cohort model still as well too. And this is really just because throughout the years, we have really learned and heard directly from our program participants that it works. It's a very strong program com component, not just in helping the students build community and connection and a support network with amongst themselves during the internship experience itself, but it also helps foster a space for them to, again, going back to what Scott and Alex have shared, really debrief and share learnings, share challenges, um, and really be in, in, in a shared experience and journey together. Uh, with Capital Pathways, we as a program have been around for like since 2016. Um, and the program was really founded because we at that time really saw an opportunity gap to get younger um, college students and specifically college students of color connected and engaged with the public policy making process. Um, at that time, the capital was about, there was about 6%, 6% of our um, Minnesota state legislature at that time identified as a, a person of color. Um, and when you compare that to at that time in 2016, the 19% people of color population that we had in Minnesota, there's an obvious gap there, right? This lets us know that 
currently our BIPOC communities and the voices of our communities of color are just not being represented to the extent that they should be when it comes to decision making that impacts their communities. Um, so the Citizens League really wanted to take opportunity to think creatively about what are the opportunities and the pathways that we can, as an organization, provide our young people of color to get exposed and to just build awareness around what public policy making even is and what all the different career paths that were available to them in that particular space. I think a big part of it is really demystifying public policy making and really shedding light on the fact that there are so many different career paths within that field that extends beyond just work at the Capitol, right? You can do really impactful policy making work and drive change in a, a organization doing grassroots organizing. You can do work at uh, your local or state government agency, right? There's a lot of different spaces for students to get plugged into to impact public policy. And that was one of the, the core goals of also why we wanted to provide this experience for students to really just continue to expose them to what was possible. And it also another huge piece was to ensure that they're connected to professionals in the public policy field that look like them and also would then create an opportunity for them to see themselves reflected in, in the field and to potentially think about how they can provide or how they can pursue these um, positions in the future. I would say that we are in a point now where we have a few years under our belt, the program has really become a flagship program of the Citizens League. Um, after this program year wraps up, we will have served 300 students of color. And a lot of the successes that we are seeing really is coming directly from the alumni in our alumni pool and network. We are seeing alumni working at the Capitol as legislative assistants. We're seeing alumni working in state government agencies. Some of them are doing at like advocacy and, and organizing work in community. And we also even have alumni doing policy work at the federal level too. So really just getting to see the trajectory of our alumni and the fact that many of them stay connected and stay engaged in public policy making um, in a past survey that we sent out, we actually learned that 70% of our participants stay engaged in public policy to some extent, whether that is pursuing additional internship opportunities in the public policy field, uh, fellowships, or full-time employment. They really stay engaged, and this is one of the opportunities for them to experience what a career in public policy making can look like. And I think for us, it's it's a lot of ideating around what it will look like if there were more opportunities like this available for them, right? What is the scale of that impact and what could that look like when these opportunities are available to them? Because we know that they're looking for these opportunities. It's just that there are limited, limited opportunities for them to, to learn about public policy making and, and to get paid while doing so, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And I think you you hit on some of the additional questions I was going to ask of, yeah, what does engagement look like afterwards? And um, yeah, just like, once again, just the theme of really, while we're intentionally creating more career pathway opportunities through internships, through apprenticeships, that, you know, whether folks choose to stay maybe in the kind of particular role that they're being upskilled into, um, we know that they're getting a lot of value and transferable skills and staying connected to, you know, the main theme of with the Capital Pathways program with advocacy. So I think that that's, that is just fantastic. Um, thank you. Yeah, no, I really appreciate that overview. And I'm going to come back with, I think, one more, one or two more questions for all of our panelists, but I want to um, have a chance to hear from Amanda with uh, Achieve Twin Cities and especially, you know, kind of focusing in now maybe on some of our youngest, younger people, um, our high schoolers, and really helping those future leaders to explore and prepare for careers following high school. Um, I know that you guys have and you shared did a great job of sharing at the top of the hour, kind of all of the additional engagements or encounters that you have for folks. But I think something I'm, I'm curious about, and maybe you can speak to this is, really about that one-on-one -on -one career counseling relationship. And if you can speak a little bit about 
maybe some themes or trends that you're seeing um, with folks that you're working with in the high schools. Yeah, it's great. And it's so fun to like hear about these opportunities because that's exactly what we're looking for for our young people. Um, so yeah, like I said, we have career and college readiness coordinators um, in 20 Minneapolis public schools and eight St. Paul public schools. So that's where our focus is. Um, we're pretty unique in that we are a universal service provider, which means we work with all students and we work with students ninth through 12th grade. So while a lot of our focus is with it, especially with advising is on seniors and putting their post-secondary plan in place. We also do um, a lot of like, like I was saying, individual advising work with younger students as well. And a lot of that work is focused on um, kind of like helping them figure out who they are, right? Who their, what their identity is, what their interests are, and then really connecting that to um, potential like career choices. So thinking about what are my interests? How does that connect with my identity? and what are some skills or goals I have, and then like helping them figure out ways to connect that to a potential career. Um, and so the one-on-one -on -one work is obviously very individualized, right? Because you know, you're know you talking to young people about who they are and what their goals are. Um, and then the other big part of our work is kind of coordinating more um, experiences, right? Career exposure opportunities. Um, and that can look a lot of different ways. Um, you know, some of our schools host on-site career fairs or on-site career panels. Um, sometimes we like bring students out to work sites um, to kind of see a little bit more in action what, what some different jobs and careers look like. And then it's really like connecting students to opportunities just like these um, where they get that little like more hands-on experiences. And I think what we see is that those are really, really important because, you know, you can like, help a student like kind of think about a career, but a lot of times they've never heard of that career and they don't even know what it means, right? Like who in ninth grade knows what like an accountant actually does on a daily basis. And so um, it's really, really helpful for young people to get out, see those things, um, get a chance to try it out. Um, and so, you know, our work with Step Up is summer internships for high school students. And those are really great. Um, and I think we're always looking for more of those types of, of opportunities for young people. Um, what we hear from our young people is that, you know, they want those opportunities. Um, it's really important for them that they're paid <laughs> um, because, you know, they, they also are, are trying to gain kind of their own financial like awareness and independence um, while they're in high school. And like they, they are looking for ways to connect the skills that they're building or what the skills are that are needed for a career. And they're saying that to us. So I think that's one of those things that sometimes we're like, are you people aware of like how skill, what skills are connected to careers? And they want that information, um, which, you know, often comes from more hands-on internship experiences. Um, and then I think the other big thing is, you know, there there is a movement right now in education, and it's national and in both of the districts we work in in Minneapolis and St. Paul, moving towards these kind of career pathway programs. Um, so in Minneapolis, that's through career and technical education. Um, and so, you know, I think our education systems are also like thinking more and more in this way of like, how do we get young people these skills, you know, get them opportunities to actually like gain credentials while they're in high school so that they can then take those out into their their next steps after high school and um the more and more that you know young people get kind of these hands-on and direct direct experiences um you know we're starting to look at like how confident students are with their next step and i think all of this work is really important with that that piece of it, you know, not just that they have a plan, but they actually feel really good about that plan and they're confident that that's going to lead to something um, that really is connected to to what they want to do and what their interests are. Um, and then the other piece I'll say that we're hearing from young people more and more is just, you know, it's I think it's hard as adults. A lot of times we'll talk about like think about your future, like think really long term, and when you think about it, like but there's a lot of pressure to just figure out what comes next for a young person. Um, but what they are saying is, you know, they really truly are thinking about this as, you know, they want a fulfilling career that's like aligned with a lot of their values and aligned with their interests. Um, and those are sometimes hard to find directly after high school. Um, like 
the experiences that get you into those like fulfilling career that you feel really good about because you haven't maybe had a lot of opportunities to explore that up until graduation. Um, but I think I just think that's really important that like young people are talking about like I want a fulfilling life sustaining career like I want it to be connected um, to my you know my own personal values and goals. And, um, I think the more that we create these types of opportunities where they get to explore things and get to experience them, the more that they'll feel really good about that next step, whatever. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think just hearing from the folks on the call, um, just the amount of, you know, dedicated one-on-one -on -one attention, being able to work intentionally in groups of your own peers, the training and development that these types of opportunities provide. I mean, just what what an amazing experience for a young person to really know that they're being um, poured into, you know, by adults that have maybe not had similar experiences in the past. Because, you know, when we're trying to do new things, it's like, you know, shoot, that would have been kind of nice if I would have had that opportunity as a young person and really galvanizing people that are maybe, you know, sharing that sentiment to say, like, we have an opportunity to make an impact to ensure that people do have the skills to succeed, whether they choose to stay in our specific career pathway or not. Um, so glad, Amanda, that you highlighted that piece um, and about career and technical education, because I would completely be um, remiss to say that, you know, words like apprenticeship, internship, work-based learning, you know, there is a lot of vernacular that's kind of baked into our conversation today that for a lot of businesses or employers would say, I don't know if that's really for us. Like, we're not in the trades. Why would we have an apprenticeship and what does the model look like? And I just think, the panel so far has done a really great job to, you know, be direct and say it's all customized, that there's a lot of opportunities to hear about apprentices that are apprenticeship programs that are working, how they work, what's being trained for what types of roles and that it's, it's not just for trades. And Scott, did I did I get something going for you with that? Anything you mm. want to share? Yeah, well, the why is, you know, that talent is equally distributed, but opportun opportunity is not. And as we all think about the workforce shortage, right, the, you know, there's all this other talent out there that has often been overlooked. I mean, and that's really the why, where each employer has come at this a little bit through their own lens. You know, some come at it through a DEI lens, some come at it through, you know, a worker shortage lens. I mean, in the end, they're sol you know, helping solve the same problem, but the why is there's great talent out there that hasn't been tapped. And here's how you can now more easily find and access a new talent source or a talent pool, I should say. Absolutely. Well, here's a question I'd love to toss to the full group, kind of building off of we, you know, hopefully folks on the call are feeling like, okay, I know what Capital Pathways program is. I know a little bit about what Achieve and the Apprenticeship Network are focused in on. And I kind of like to ground us back into the participants, the young people, the people going through these programs. Um, and maybe just talk if anybody has uh, pieces that they'd like to share about what are maybe some of uh, the common barriers that you're seeing um, for folks that are coming into these programs? I mean, I think that we've we've talked a little bit about why the programs were created and that they're definitely, yeah, like Scott said, um, skills are everywhere, but opportunity, unfortunately, is not. Um, but yeah, any maybe specific stories about um, participants in your program that you would want to share? I can jump in. <laughs> I'll, I'll go briefly, Scott. I saw that you unmuted yourself too. Um, so I don't think it's a specific story, but um, for for us anyway, a lot of the barriers, um, it's a, it's systemic, right? Uh, in the public policy making field, for a very long time, and we're we're getting much more diverse, uh, but there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. And I think for a very long time. When you think about being a young person, um, a young person of color who have not really seen people who look like you represented in these specific career fields or spaces, you just don't even 
have the capacity to imagine what it would look like for you to pursue a potential career path in in policy, for instance, right? So I think for us, what we have heard often from our students is that it's just that lack of awareness and, and knowledge to even know that this is something that they can pursue. Um, so a lot of the work is also going to what Amanda said, it's building that confidence, it's connecting connecting them to the opportunities, it's connecting them to networks who can open those doors for them and continue to mentor them on their journey if they do decide that they want to stay in this particular field. Um, many of our students also have identified um, payment and compensation as a barrier, um, which is why for us, our program, it's really critical to ensure that the expectation we have with all employers who work with our program is that they pay their students a minimum of $15 an hour. And this is really just to ensure that we are valuing young people for their talents, for their perspectives, and for their contribution, um, because they bring a lot to the organizations that they work with during their time that they are spending in our programs. They bring a lot of fresh perspectives that many of our organizations benefit from, if not in the sh like in the short term and also long term. Um, so for us, it's really important that we're thinking about how it is that we can continue to keep, I would say, keep in touch with the ways in which internships, apprenticeships, and other work-based learning opportunities are evolving as the environment that we are in evolves as well too. One thing to know is that since the pandemic, the nature of internships in our experience has changed a lot. Um, and Maddie, you had mentioned that maybe a, a barrier or um, some employers might be unsure about participating because they don't know what an internship experience looks like. They don't know what it means to participate or to be a part of the internship experience. I challenge them and encourage them to think about ways in which they can be creative about entering the space and rethinking and reimagining what an internship experience can be. Um, right now, every internship experience that even we're working with, every organization has a different structure set up based on the needs of their organization and the needs and availability and interests of the students. So it's really customizable. Um, this is a word that I think Maddie mentioned before. So I really, really want to just highlight that piece because there isn't one model of what a quote unquote, good internship looks like. It's really based on the goals of the organization, the goals of the particular student, and they're really working together to co-create that experience together. Awesome, I would love to chime in. Um, I had one kind of thought around barriers and I would actually say this particular barrier spans both um, participants, the job seekers, as well as employers um, centered around, you know, that that overarching umbrella of very traditional hiring practices, specifically within roles requiring a four year college degree. Now, I want to be very clear, a four year college degree carries a tremendous amount of value. Accenture has a very intentional hiring pathway for individuals to come into our organization with a four year degree. However, to Scott's earlier point, approximately two thirds of the working population doesn't have a four year degree. So if your role description requires a four year degree, and that's right on the job description, the application page, you are right off the bat eliminating two thirds of the population from being considered for your roles. So um, with when thinking about that as a barrier, again, I would really encourage um, individuals you know, who are maybe looking for jobs to not feel as though if they are not pursuing a four-year degree or do not have a four-year degree, that they are not, um, they're not eligible or they're not qualified for certain roles. And then from that employer perspective, again, I think it's just taking a look at your role descriptions and really um, revisiting that, that need for skills and identifying roles where 
perhaps a four year degree could qualify an individual, but also a boot camp or really an aptitude for technology or someone who taught themselves how to code, right? And there are a array of skills that can be taught and coached through on the job. So really kind of, again, revisiting what are your requirements for your entry level roles? Do they require a four year degree or can you open up the aperture for what you consider candidates and therefore diversify the talent pool that you are seeking? And then just to add a little bit for like from a high schooler perspective, I think um, Kalia touched on this, but I mean, when you think about like high school students are balancing a lot, they're juggling a lot. And so I think it's just really important that this is that these kind of opportunities are built into some of the spaces they're already in or the structures. So, you know, the partnership work between um, schools or districts um, and kind of some of these programs is really important. And then, you know, we often hear from our young people that they're much more likely to do something if they hear about it from like somebody they already know or from a friend. And so I think just when you're thinking about like, how do we get young people more interested in these things? Again, like going to the the places they are and the systems they're already kind of involved with. Um, I think it's always important to like make sure students and young people still have the opportunity to explore their interests, right? Like, and when you think about it, it's like a hard balance of like, do I take this opportunity, which is more, maybe more something I'm interested in, or like go out on the limb and do something that like I've never even heard of, thought of. Um, and so the way to like combine some of that stuff for young people, I think, is also really important. Absolutely. Well, thank you for that one. Um, I, I feel like we got at so many different aspects um, that I wanted to reiterate. So so well done, everyone. <laughs> that was great. Um, I, we're getting towards the end of our time. Um, and I want to make sure there's kind of a, a larger and maybe we would, in the context of this conversation, call it more of like an adult question, because we I'm asking you to think long term, which I know is a, a kind of concept that we put on our young people a lot, but um, maybe it is time that adults talk a little bit more long term, which is, you know, five and 10 years from now, I know like a couple of the programs that are on the call, like have maybe been in the game for a couple of years and you feel like you're gaining momentum and you've changed. And I think, you know, just to name in a more pointed way, like that the experience of going through an internship or an apprenticeship program is different after COVID, it, it probably physically looks really different. Um, the interest and the needs, you know, knowing that our young people need to be um, compensated and then that is, could be, or probably is prob one of the larger barriers to folks choosing to take one of these programs is knowing, hey, you know, I need to be making some money, but I, I really know I need to be developing skills. Can I, can I access something that's both? Um, important to say that, but yeah, I mean, I'd love to kind of go around the horn like five and 10 years from now um, as you look at these programs, like what what sort of future success are you planning for, hoping for, or, or wanting to see um, when you look at your your different programs? I can start. Um, <clears throat> and I think we're somewhere into the five year kind of 10 year plan where we fully expect that the apprentice model will be one of our entry level hiring pathways where we have those for four years and now those for non four years. And a couple years back, our CEO went as far as putting a stake in the ground saying, 20% of all entry level hiring will be through our apprentice program, which signaled to all of our hiring areas that, you know, this is standard practice now and that, you know, you need to all be hiring through this channel and it's not a special program anymore. It's part of how we run ourselves. Um, and so, I mean, I sort of see other companies getting there of like, this is now another pathway in and it's not a special program, you know, and I think for some that will take five years where it probably took us five years at least, um, but that 
it becomes much more, you know, you know, standard, I guess, is a, a hope. And I think we're actually, you know, seeing that. And maybe just to um, put a, put an accent on one thing that Scott said. So as we think about apprenticeship, not you know in five to ten years being considered a special program within an organization, I would really like to see apprenticeship not with an asterisk that we're trying to move apprenticeship within professional roles, but that apprenticeship is very much all-encompassing, building skills and roles for the work of the future. Um, so just thinking about apprenticeship more broadly and not having to put that asterisk behind it when we talk about apprenticeship specific to more kind of non-traditional apprenticeship roles. Awesome. I can go. Um, I think, yeah, exactly what Scott now just said. I think for young people, like having more of these types of opportunities um, in five years is, is really, really important. But also, I think from an advising perspective, what is currently really, really challenging with like any kind of apprenticeship um, as a next step is that there isn't a streamlined process. And so it's pretty complicated to advise students when it's like, you know, you have to first find the program and then it has a different process for applying, it's a different deadline. And then different, you know, <laughs> completely different like models. So I think, you know, hopefully in five years, there will be a way for like a young person to say, you know, I want a next step that, you know, the training is quick or it's a part of the employer. And then I want to like, you know, be able to move quickly into that career and that there's a place that we can direct young people to do that exploration and that the process is very streamlined. Um, and that it, it it's, that we've removed some of the complication for like a young person wanting to do that as their next step, I think is is really important. Um, in addition to just, yeah, like I said, a lot more employers moving in this direction because I think young people are interested in, you know, kind of these shorter term, shorter process training programs where they can then move into their career more quickly. Well, I will jump in. Um, I would say that big picture, long term goal of Capital Pathways, we're we're really doing systems change work. We're doing work to really help diversify the field of public policy making, um, to really ensure that communities of color are engaged and also informed in decision making that impacts them and their communities. So that's really like the overarching long term goal that we see um, and that we understand would be defined as, as success for the program if this is something that we can have some measurements or metrics to track on a longer term basis right seeing more people of color represented in different public policy making careers and spaces seeing them in leadership positions seeing them with decision making power um i would say on the in a shorter shorter term um or more uh, a contained um understanding for our program as to what success can also look like is um, thinking about what it can look like if the capital pathways model was to be replicated for different age groups, um, replicated at the local level, replicated um, nationally, what would that look like? Um, how would the curriculum change so that it also addresses the needs of the participants? Because we're assuming that depending on, on the changes where the, the scope of who it is that we're serving, the needs were also shift as well too. And then I think something else to just add on would be to ensure that we are constantly thinking and keeping tabs on how the field of internships is evolving mm -hmm. um, as things shift and as needs shift as well too. Um, so a piece of this is really just keeping an open mind to what impact and success looks like. And I think a lot of this work is based on continuously keeping engaged and keeping in contact with your participants, hearing from them about what has worked well with the programs, but as they kind of maybe, you know, transition into full-time employment, what are some of the barriers that stand in their way when it comes to engaging um, in the public policy making field? Uh, what are the needs so that we as a 
as a I would say as a fields can better understand how we can provide the trainings and the support and the resources to help them set themselves up for success and to navigate the space beyond just their participation in the program. So thinking about it more long term and and what is it that we can be doing to support their their journey and to ensure that they have the resources and the networks and um the uh the information that is needed to to not only stay in the field but then to also thrive as well too right absolutely and thanks brian for um there was a question in the chat about our panelists open to follow-up questions via email and if so would you be willing to share your contact info in the chat um i'll probably also just put out to the panel if you're open to that being sent to anyone who registered that may be watching on playback um that would be greatly appreciated and to kalia's point it sounds like maybe this is a conversation that we need to have again um, as these programs continue to evolve and just kind of the landscape of what does it mean to be an intern, to be an apprentice, to participate in work-based learning. What does it look like? How can we improve it? And how can we um, hopefully collectively work together to raise awareness and meet our individualized goals? So, and I saw that you just put your email in the chat. Thanks, Kalia. We are at our time which is a good and bad problem that we have to say goodbye to all these awesome people on the call, but we get to continue on with our afternoon. Um, just want to say thank you so much to the panel. Um, I know that this is always an interesting ask, putting you on the screen and you got to look at yourself and talk to other people. And I hopefully, um, hopefully you met the goals that you came to our conversation with. And if you're watching, thank you for being here. And if you're watching it on playback, please check out the description below for some additional information about these great organizations and the work that they do. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. I hope you have a great rest of the day and um, we hope to see you again soon. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everybody.